Thank you for the introduction. It's great to be back at NZOC. Uh, yes, it was a bit of a strife this morning. Um, I've completely forgotten how long it takes to get into Australia on a German passport. Um, about an hour, actually, in the queue. Um, but anyway, it's great to be here. Um, and it's great to talk about this topic of transparency and decision making. Um, with the permission from the chair, I would like to modify the topic slightly in two ways. First of all, I would like to tr define transparency perhaps slightly differently compared to the previous session. Um, obviously, transparency can mean many different things. Um, it could mean, for example, that um, some things can never be fully transparent, uh, no matter how much we wish for transparency in government services, because some areas of uh, government policy simply don't open themselves to that. I mean, you think of intelligence services and the police and secret services and the like, but also um, commercial and sensitive um, uh, information or even trade negotiations as we're currently seeing with the TPP. So some areas of government policy will probably never be as transparent as we would like them to be. And that's just the nature of the things. But anyway, that was not really what I was going to talk about anyway. What I really want to talk about is the link between um, transparency and the political reform process. Um, when we're talking about the policy process, um, what we are interested in is how to make it predictable, how interactive we can make it, how open we can make it, or well in short, how transparent we can make it. And I would argue, and this is my main thesis for today, that the question then of how transparent we can make government processes in policy formulation is really linked quite closely to the ability of the government to reform. So you might call this the reform responsiveness of government or the reformability of a country. Um, and my main thesis, as I said, it is really that this um, reformability is closely linked to transparency and transparency, I think, is the key to actually getting a government on the path of reform. And I explored this uh, in some detail in this essay that um, was just mentioned. It's called The Quiet Achievers and it was published um, late last year by the Menzies Research Center in Canberra. And I'll explain a little bit more about um, how this came about, but if you're interested in the publication, you can find it on my personal website where you can download it free of charge. It's um, oliverhartwig.com um, if you are interested and you want to have a look at that. The second way in which I would like to slightly broaden the perspective um, on the topic of today's discussion is to take it a little bit beyond just transtestment perspectives but at some of my um, own observations, because I mean, as, you, as I already mentioned, I'm German, you would have never picked it up from my accent anyway. Um, but I also worked in the UK and I worked in Australia before I moved to New Zealand, so I would like to add a few observations on that as well. Because I think, again, if you're looking at these different countries, what you can see is that uh, the way in which um, government policies were introduced, how they were prepared, how transparent these processes were really um, determined the outcomes and determined the, the long-term success of these government policies. So um, let me start then speaking about um, the link between transparency and successful economic reforms. As I said, that's the main thesis of the Quiet Achievers essay. Just to give you a bit of a background why I wrote this essay last year. New Zealand, of course, had an election in late 2014 which saw the uh, government of John Key returned, um, elected for a third term. And what I found interesting at the time was just reading through the Australian newspapers and the New Zealand newspapers and the commentary and the, the spin, the narrative that um, the newspapers really put on this election. And it was markedly different if you compared Australian and New Zealand newspapers. So what I read in the Australian press was um, typically a story about a radical reformist, neoliberal, whatever you might call this government, being returned to power. Um, and that was seen as something very surprising to an Australian audience because in Australia the narrative had just gotten hold that reform is basically a thing of the past and no longer possible. If you read Paul Kelly in The Australian, um, I mean, that's basically the column he's been writing in variations for about 15 years now. <coughs> I like Paul Kelly's columns, but um, I think they've become very bitter and very predictable in some ways because um, he always contrasts the great experience um, of um, you know, the end of certainty when reforms happened and when he was the chronic of, of these reforms to today's rather sobering experience of just watching nothing, nothing much happen. Um, so the interesting thing was actually looking through um, newspaper columns in Australia at the time that it didn't matter whether it was Henry Ergus writing in uh, the newspapers or in the Australian 
or whether it was Peter Harcher writing in the Sydney Morning Herald, um, they both agreed that John Key was um, a massively reformist, ambitious, activist prime minister implementing his agenda and being returned as a reward. Um, but if you contrast that to the narrative in New Zealand newspapers, um, I think nobody in New Zealand would have put it in these terms. How many Kiwis do we have in the audience actually? Okay, just a few. So I think if we're only reading New Zealand newspapers, it doesn't matter whether you read the NBR or the Dom Post or the New Zealand Herald, I think nobody would have described John Key in, in these terms that you would have found in the Sydney Morning Herald on the Australian. Um, so that was the starting point for writing the essay, trying to figure out who's right, whether the Australian commentators got it right or the New Zealand commentators got it right and who actually adequately describes uh, the uh, strategic approach of John Key's government. Also, of course, the whole thing seen in the context of, as I mentioned, this Australian reform holiday, um, where arguably the last real decent uh, microeconomic reform was the introduction of the GST in July 2000. And even that was not nearly as good as the New Zealand one, of course. Um, and also in the context of this general um, mood that reform is something that's no longer possible, this Paul Kelly view of the world, which you can probably also see in uh, quotes like uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's um, famous dictum that um, we all know what needs to be done, we just don't know how to get re-elected after we've done it. Um, and finally, the essay is of course also written in the context of an increasingly positive um, story about New Zealand in Australian newspapers where what I recognized when I moved from Australia to New Zealand three years ago, I had to explain my choice and I was very much swimming against the tide. The net migration loss from New Zealand to Australia at the time was about 40,000 people, which is massive for a country the size of New Zealand. But the narrative had completely changed and by late last year, everybody was talking very positively and glowingly about New Zealand and the Australian media. Um, and they were um, discussing how it could be that a country that had not just lived through the GFC as Australia had, but didn't have a mining boom, but it instead had to battle with the results of a few earthquakes, um, was still closer to a budget surplus at the time than Australia was. So that was really the trigger behind writing this um, essay and trying to figure out um, who was right and whether the key government was actually a reformist government or whether it was really just as um, hopeless and dithering as Rodney Hyde writes in the National Business Review. Um, but that's just Rodney Hyde. So, um, my basic conclusion was actually that when we're looking at the New Zealand government, we see a government which I would call as, um, well, I, I tried to coin a phrase for that and I'm not quite sure which one it was. It could be radical incrementalism or it could be incremental radicalism. I think they both come to roughly the same conclusion. And what I mean by that is really that when we're looking at the key government in New Zealand, we see a government that does quite a few radical things, but it does them step by step, one bit at a time. And so if you give key long enough, he will probably reform the country quite substantially, but it won't just happen in one big swoop and not all the reforms will be introduced at the same time. So I tried to identify the strategy behind Key's approach and because I once studied marketing, I had to come up with a snappy formula. And my formula was um, in analogy to the marketing uh, four P's, you know, place, price, promotion and product, of course. In Key's case, I thought it was rather preparation, patience, pragmatism, and principles. If you want to add a few more Ps, maybe you could add passion and performance as well, but for now I think the four Ps will do. So basically what I was trying to explain was how Key and how Bill English, how the whole New Zealand government tries to um, reform the country, but not in a, in a way that alienates huge parts of the population, but that allows them to even get re-elected despite having done substantial and significant reform work. And to link it to this session, I think it really comes down to transparency. Because what the key government does very successfully, it is establishing narratives. It is establishing these narratives by explaining what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it. They're consulting, they're taking time. So let me just talk you through the four Ps. The first key P in the context of key's government, I think, is preparation. Preparation means that it takes a lot of time before anything really happens. But that preparation time is necessary to build the narrative, to take the public along the journey and explain really why what they're doing is necessary. For those of you who heard um, Paula Bennett this morning, I missed her, but I've heard her so many times now, so I can kind of figure out what she probably said. She would have told you about how long it took until the government actually figured out what they were trying to achieve and how they were going to do it. 
Paula Bennett, of course, is the best example, perhaps, of um, this um, preparation approach because she spent the um, full first term really preparing, laying the ground for the welfare reforms that the key government then introduced in the second term. So basically three years spent preparing with the welfare um, working group, um, consulting very widely. Closely linked to this um, preparation P is the patience P. So I think it is a mistake for governments, especially newly elected governments, to try to do everything at once and introduce all policies in was just one single budget, as Tony Abbott, of course, tried um, last year. Um, Key wouldn't do that. Key actually has the time and takes a very long-term approach to introducing his policies. I think that requires a lot of patience, but it's the patience that's required to do the preparation properly and to consult widely. And he consults widely, um, not just with um, special bodies like the um, Welfare Reform Working Group, but also with organizations like the Productivity Commission, which in the New Zealand context is still a relatively new organization that was only introduced in Key's first term. With that um, comes a lot of pragmatism. I think um, no matter how much uh, Peter Hartshaw describes uh, John Key as a, a neoliberal activist, I think deep down he's a pragmatist. And first and foremost, he's a pragmatist because he, he knows exactly what he can um, get implemented and what he can find majorities for. He wouldn't go too far beyond that. And he would never really wait for the opportunity to introduce a first best solution which might never arise, uh, arrive. Um, if he could at least get a second or sometimes a third best solution and, and then start um, or work on refining these uh, second and third best solutions. So we've got the first three P's of preparation, of patience, of pragmatism, and so far I could have probably described Angela Merkel as well. Um, but there's a fourth P and that's principles. With Angela Merkel, you never quite know where you land. Um, quite literally, a uh, former Social Democrat um, defense minister in Merkel's first cabinet put it quite nicely and when he said, um, if Angela Merkel was a pilot, you could safely board a, a flight with her, safe in the knowledge that you would arrive safely, as long as you don't care where you land. Because um, Merkel basically makes up her policies um, on the go, on the fly. Um, she commissioned 600 opinion polls in her second term, which um, Spiegel magazine revealed last year, so on average about three a week. And Spiegel magazine called it government by numbers. And that's not too far off. Um, so she is basically taking any kind of position and the opposite. And she's been chancellor for 10 years and I still have no idea what she really believes in. I think with John Key, we're seeing a very different kind of politician. I think we can all tell now where his instincts lie, even though he doesn't implement everything in one go. But I think he wants to lead New Zealand towards um, a, a more market-based approach, uh, uh, an approach that um, in, uh, incorporates uh, microeconomic reforms, but he doesn't do that all at once, and he actually prepares the groundwork for that. So I think if we're thinking about the key government as one that's driven by preparation, patience, pragmatism, and principles, you've got the rough picture, I think, of how key leads his government. And typically, as long as he sticks to his four Ps, um, it's working pretty well for him, for him personally, for his approval ratings, for his party, and actually for the country as a whole. Where he's deviating from the four Ps, it doesn't work so well for him. And I want to give you a few examples of um, both successes of the key government and I think some of the failings before I get to the limitations of the four Ps. So I think on, on um, fiscal policy, for example, we can see this approach of the four Ps working quite well. A, um, a chapter in my little essay called um, The Patient English, and I'm referring, of course, to Bill English, the Minister of Finance, who has been an incredibly patient finance minister, never losing the sight, um, no, losing sight of his ultimate goal of uh, leading the budget back to surplus. Um, but he's doing it in a, in a very um, in an incremental way, um, and I think in a very successful way in difficult circumstances. We shouldn't forget, of course, that the Canterbury earthquakes cost um, the public sector massively. The second example where I think reform has really worked um, remarkably well is Paula Bennett's welfare reforms. And you heard her this morning, the investment approach that she pioneered. I think that has worked extremely well. The counter examples where the key government has actually failed to deliver um, were those examples where they really didn't spend enough time preparing and where they didn't have the patience to really um, explain what they were doing. Prime example, I think, is um, Hikia Parata's um, attempt, the education minister's attempt to introduce or reduce the class sizes. 
um, because all the research points to the fact that it's more important to have very good teachers rather than having small classes, and she wanted to just change the priorities of her department spending. But she didn't explain why she was doing it, and it was all introduced without much consultation, and um, it completely backfired on her. The other example, I think, are social impact bonds. That's um, another policy that the government has just in introduced this year. It was launched um, at the Queen's birthday uh, holiday weekend, and bizarrely, the government picked mental health as the area for the first social bond. Now, for a relatively experimental policy, I think this was not quite the right way to, to go about it. They should have first explained why they're doing it. Very few people had ever heard of social impact bonds. Um, they're still a relatively new instrument anyway internationally, and they've only been around for five or six years. And the, the one area in which they have actually worked best and where there is the most experience internationally is actually in recidivism and dealing with prison populations. So I think the government could have done a much better job at just explaining what they're trying to achieve, pointing towards international um, examples and actually taking the public on board with this, uh, for this new policy instrument of social impact bonds when in fact they went straight into mental health, which is one of the most controversial areas and therefore I think it backfired on them. The other limitation to the 4P approach and to radical incre incrementalism, I think, is public opinion. So John Key is very well aware of public opinion, probably as well aware as Angela Merkel is, and therefore there are some I issues that he simply wouldn't touch and he wouldn't even try to prepare the public for changes, even if they're necessary. I'm thinking of, uh, for example, foreign direct investment regulation. I think of some radical changes to local government finance and the housing market. That's, I think, where um, Key is probably too timid to really go beyond um, what is achievable even in the medium term. Um, I think in the session brief we talked a little bit about the role of the media and I would just like to say that I don't really see a big difference between the media because you don't have that many um, columnists, journalists really making the case for reforms in New Zealand either. So I think we often see, unfortunately, a very um, stereotypical left versus right debate in New Zealand when in fact we should just be debating what works and what doesn't and we should have a more empirical debate. Um, but in any case, to lead it back to the question of transparency, I think um, what we can learn from Key's example is the important importance of transparency because if you communicate your policies well, if you really establish a narrative, you've got a much better chance not just of implementing them but actually of having long-lived policies where they wouldn't just be changed at the next government and not just at the next um, opinion poll. So Key, I think, is doing a relatively good job as prime minister. Um, he's not a perfect prime minister by any um, measure. He's certainly not a perfect politician, and I don't believe that um, perfect prime ministers or perfect politicians exist in any case. But he gets a lot of, done, a lot of things done while still keeping his personal popularity and uh, retaining the public support. Now, if I just want to briefly mention some international examples, counter examples of what happens when you don't do that. One of the prime examples that comes to my mind is actually the German Schröder government. Schröder, Gerd Schröder, um, led a um, center-left coalition of the Social Democrats and the Greens, and under the impression of 5 million unemployment in the winter of 2002-03 in Germany, he introduced massive welfare reforms, but they were not nearly as radical as um, the kind of stuff that Paula Bennett does in New Zealand. The difference between Paula Bennett and Gerd Schröder was that Schröder did spend, didn't spend any time whatsoever explaining why he was doing it. I mean, all he basically said was, well, look, we've got five million unemployed, we have to do something. But he didn't establish a narrative around it. He didn't really establish a narrative of we have to help people. That's what Paula Bennett did. But he basically said, we've got a national crisis, a national emergency, and we need to do something quickly. Well, he was punished for that. He was punished um, personally, his approval ratings went down, his party was punished, and they've never recovered from it. So when Schröder first became chancellor, the Social Democrats were typically just around the 40% mark. They have been in the ghetto of around 23 to 25% since. So the party is still suffering the um, consequences of Schröder's um, welfare reforms, which were undoubtedly necessary, but never communicated well. Another example, I think, is David Cameron in the UK, because David Cameron, um, in opposition, hardly ever talked about the issues he then had to tackle as prime minister. He hated talking about Europe. I know that because I worked in David Cameron's favorite think tank, and we were not allowed uh, to use the E word because it was so divisive for the Tory party. Um, Cameron never wanted to talk about it. It was traumatic for his own party. He knew precisely what happened to his predecessors, so he didn't really spend any time on, on it in opposition. He didn't talk about austerity. He didn't talk about alternatives to labor spending programs. And then suddenly in 2010, he was prime minister, and he had to, under the pressure from his own backbench, under the pressure of UKIP, under the pressure of circumstances. He suddenly had to talk about Europe, and he suddenly had to do something about the economy and the budget deficit. 
But that's of course not how to win the public, uh, win public support. And yes, he won the election um, just a few months ago. But if you really dig through the election result in the UK in 2015, you can actually see that Cameron's result is quite meager and there's never been a government re-elected on such a slim a sh popular share of the vote as Cameron's government. So I think Cameron hasn't done that particularly well introducing these reforms. And finally, I think looking at Australia, um, um, I, I don't think I'm stretching it too far when I say that uh, Tony Abbott probably didn't quite communicate what he was trying to do too well. Um, and he certainly didn't take the public with him. Um, but I think I'll leave it here because I don't want to impinge too much on your presentation. But just in contrast, in New Zealand, I think we're really seeing a government that is trying to be as transparent as it gets um, in trying to explain their case for reform, trying to take the public with them, because I think that is the, the only chance we have in today's society to introduce reforms that are necessary, which some commentators believe are no longer possible, and where, at least in the Australian case, in your newspapers here, I have found a certain defeatism around even the R word. You shouldn't even mention it anymore, according to Christina Keneally. Um, so, New Zealand, I think, should encourage us all that reforms are still possible. But I think what New Zealand also demonstrates quite nicely is that reforms need a good marketing plan and a good strategy and a good narrative. And that's basically the, my thesis of Quiet Achievers, and I'm happy to discuss that with you later. Thank you.